Good morning, good afternoon, excellences, colleagues. Thank you for being here. Um, UNFPA is pleased to host this event, which is to commemorate the start of the 16 days of activism to end violence against women. And we are very pleased to be hosting this event with the permanent missions of Australia and South Africa to the UN. This event is gonna be moderated on our behalf by Ms. Melissa Noel. Um, Melissa Noel is a multimedia journalist, an award-winning journalist, and she's done work around um, digital content and media. And um, she's also an international correspondent and a producer. And in her work, she's covered race, culture, and travel topics for television and for digital media. So it gives me great pleasure on behalf of our executive director to invite Melissa Noel to moderate the session for us. Melissa, over to you. Thank you so much, Dawn, and good morning, good afternoon, good day to everyone who is joining you. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, welcome to Women and Girls Right to Occupy Space Safely. This morning, I'm gonna lead you through a very important discussion on gender-based violence. Again, this event is co-organized by the United Nations Population Fund, the permanent mission of Australia to the UN and the permanent mission of South Africa to the UN to commemorate the International Day for Ending Violence Against Women and to mark the start of the 16 days of activism to end gender-based violence that'll be taking place from November 25th through December 10th. Gender-based violence or GBV is one of the most pervasive human rights violations in the world. And it's a public health issue of pandemic proportions. The latest estimates by the World Health Organization indicate that as many as one third of women, we're talking about approximately 736 million women will be subjected to physical or sexual violence by their partner or sexual violence by a non-partner and in their lifetime. And what's so unfortunate about these statistics although those are staggering already, is that this kind of violence against women starts early. As one in four young women between the ages of 15 to 24 who have been in a relationship will have already experienced violence by an intimate partner by the time they reach their early 20s. In times of crisis, the number of women facing abuse rises. And it's something that we've seen throughout this COVID-19 pandemic. And it's been further intensified in the virtual space online where more and more women are facing technology facilitated violence. And because we use, we're on our phones, we're on the internet, we're even in this session, we're online so much, it's expanding and it's really hard to get a handle on. But today's conversation, we have an aim to encourage both individual and collective action to end gender-based violence. And we're doing that by starting off with dialogue today. We're promoting engagement at all levels to end gender-based violence through partnership, empathetic and meaningful conversations like this one we're about to have, communication, advocacy, and innovation. And it's important to us to also amplify UNFPA's work in moving us from activism to accountability, to end gender-based violence with a particular focus on what I just mentioned, that technology facilitated gender-based violence, what we're seeing taking place online. We wanna highlight the ways today in which we can call people into the conversation, call people in to take action instead of calling them out for what we perceive as inaction. We wanna make people feel um, empowered and inspired to take action because this is, um, this is a community effort. This is a collective effort. And so when we call people into the conversation, it's something in a way that will promote action and promote unity so that we can put an end to gender-based violence. So to get us started this morning, I have the pleasure of introducing Nafisato Diop, who's the chief of gender, the gender human rights branch, who will 
deliver opening remarks on behalf of UNFPA's Deputy Executive Director, Diana Keita, who is unable to join us this morning and sends her regards. Good morning and thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Madam Moderator, for this fantastic introduction. Uh, I would like to uh, uh, deliver this remark on behalf of Ms. Guinea Keita, our uh, executive, uh, Deputy Executive Director, who is currently in Niger in the field, and uh, she sent her apology, but she faced some challenges in joining this morning. She was so excited at the idea of being part of this panel. Uh, so she sent her apology. Excellencies, Ambassador Matthew Giordini, South Africa Permanent Representative, Ambassador Dr. Fiona Webster, Australia Deputy Permanent Representative, <clears throat> Madam Gladys Acosta Vargas, Chairperson for the CEDAW Committee, uh, Andrea Vojna, Deputy Representative uh, for uh, you know, our dear representative who is going to present a fantastic experience from our country office in Mozambique. Dear partners, colleagues, friends, and with a special thanks to the permanent mission of Australia and South Africa for co-hosting this high level dialogue with UNFPA. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all. A shadow pandemic of domestic and gender-based violence, including violence in online space, has rapidly taken hold as a result of increasing tension in the home, increasing financial burdens, and women increasingly being isolated with abusers under lockdowns. This is a situation that we have lived during the past almost two years now, and we are seeing that in some countries, they are going back into this lockdown. I would like to share a story with you. It is a story of one woman in Mexico, but it is universal story for millions of women all over the world. Her boyfriend was unfaithful and she thought if she consented to his request to record a sexual video with him, he would not seek other women. Her boyfriend recorded the video in a way that only she was featured. First, he show up on WhatsApp, then Facebook. This is the story of Olympia Coral Melo Cruz from Mexico. I can tell her story because she allowed us to tell the story and because she decided to fought back. At first, Olympia faced distress of what she had experienced. Uh, she really uh, was, you know, ashamed. She was, she stopped going to school. She avoided people and even became suicidal. She was lucky to have a mother caring and strong who urged her to fight back. Fight daughter, because you are not at fault. This is what her mother said. In response to her mother challenge, Olympia became an activist. Her activism led to the Le Olympia translate, Olympia's law in uh, Spanish, which was approved by legislator on 29 April, 2021. And we want to recognize that important legal instrument that imposed penalties of up to six years in prison for disseminating image of intimate and sexual content without the consent of the person involved. Sadly, Olympia's story is not an isolated one. Around the world, women's sexuality is being weaponized against them in online space also. This is why UNFPA is actively working to protect the virtual space and make it safe. We are maximizing the organizing power of the UN Secretary General Unite by 2030 to end violence against women campaign to convene this high level dialogue as well as other events starting today and through to December 10. I just want again to remind as our moderator, you know, already told us 
the number of women affected by gender-based violence is shocking. The latest estimates indicate that as many as one in three women, approximately 736 million women. And when we look at the young generation, 15 to 24 years old, who is using, of course, this online space a lot, we, the number are one in four young women that are subjected to physical or sexual violence by their partner or non-partner in their lifetime. And along with the sharp increase in use of information technology, we see the unfortunate proliferation of new technology facilitated violence intended to silence, intimidate, and restrict women and girls use of the internet. No space is human. It is startling that in spite of all the technological and social, societal advances, women continue to be stuck by violence in their home, workplace, street, on social media, and on the internet. Gender-based violence undermines the health, dignity, security, and autonomy of its victims, yet it remains shrouded in the culture of silence. Women and girls who experience violence suffer psychosocial and mental health, as well as sexual and reproductive health consequences. The effects of technology-facilitated gender-based violence are severe and have lasting impact, including emotional distress, fear, loss of status, decreased productivity, and suicide. This is wrong. It is not only wrong, it is a scandal. Whether online or offline, violence against women and girls is part of a damaging power dynamic that is based on patriarchy that must shift now. A girl must grow up knowing it is her right to walk down the street or take public transportation or access the internet free from fear. Under our four year span of our current strategic plan, UNFPA partners with so many governments to implement hundreds of GBV programs. And we have allocated half a billion US dollars for the prevention, protection, and care of women and girls affected by gender-based violence, and thanks to the donors who are supporting us. UNFPA is actively working to protect the virtual space and make it safe. For instance, with UN Women and the analytics company Kilt AI, UNFPA spearheaded analysis in the Asia-Pacific region, which helped to shed light on just how pervasively women fear for their safety and also reflects how governments and service providers have struggled to respond optimally. We cannot allow technology to become yet another way to silence, harm, and bully women and girls. Olympia's story reminds us that we can each play a role to disrupt the cycle of violence. The UNFP is calling on each of you, each one, whether you're a mother, father, sister, brother, friend, colleagues, legislator, civil servant, or diplomat, to be a GBV disruptor, to prevent and respond to all types of violence, including technology-facilitated violence. Technology is a fantastic tool that can be used as a potent tool towards ending violence. However, it requires action from everyone, government, businesses, big tech, academia, women-led and faith-based civil organizations in the society organization, all of us here to harness that good potential. I'm confident that together we can make peace a reality, peace in the home, peace in our community, peace in our schools and workplace and in virtual space online also, peace and respect. Let's make peace and human rights a reality for every woman and girl everywhere, beginning now, beginning today. Thank you so much. And I want to thank you so much for those remarks. Um, and one thing that I want to mention from those remarks that we just heard from the chief of gender, hum the gender human rights branch, Nafisato Diop, is that we all have a part to play in ending gender-based violence. And you can we can utilize our platforms, whether big or small, to play our part in that. And that um 
there's no role too small that you can play in terms of trying to make uh, utilizing technology to put an end to gender based violence. You can do your part, I can do my part as well, because there are a lot of effects that this has on women of all ages, but thinking about our young women who utilize technology is just, just part of everyday life to do so. So I wanna thank you so much for those opening remarks and just getting our minds thinking about the importance of this discussion today and how we are going to, over these next 16 days, really think about how we can act um, and do our part to end gender-based violence. So now it is my pleasure to introduce the South Africa Permanent Representative, Ambassador Matthew Joyini to deliver remarks this morning. So good day to you and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much, Melissa. Uh, Madame Diop, Excellencies, distinguished delegates, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. And I really want to thank the UNFPA for this gathering of women's rights advocates to commemorate the 25th November day for elimination of violence against women. And indeed, we have seen violence against women and children increase significantly during the difficult time of dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic, including in my own country, South Africa. We are therefore determined as a country to be part of the UN Secretary General's Unite by 2030 to end violence against women campaign. We thank uh, the executive director for inviting us to join others in echoing and raising our voice on women and girls' rights to occupy safe space safely. It is the duty of all of us, our governments, multilateral institutions, and civil society, not only to demand that, but to also create space, safe spaces for women and girls. South Africa continues to experience increasing number of gender-based violence and femicide. And like others, we have seen a move to technology facilitated gender-based violence. So we're very pleased that in this series of dialogue you'll be hosting, you will be dedicating time and space for us to look at this phenomenon, exchange ideas and best practices on how to deal with it. And as noted in the concept note, the most, and I, this morning it's also been said by, by you, uh, uh, Melissa and uh, Madame Dior, the most damaging part of, about technology facilitated GBV is that it can happen any, anytime, anywhere and everywhere given the, all the devices that we have. It indeed does extend the reach of abuse by perpetrators. So while South Africa has made significant progress towards achieving gender equality, the task that is facing us today is to deal decisively with GBV. And I'd like to share with you briefly um, the sustained efforts of the South African government in partnership with civil society on public engagement to end sketch of gender-based violence. And I think public engagement was highlighted again in the concept group as very key to addressing gender-based violence. Firstly, it is through the power of legislation. And we, as a constitutional democracy, our constitution, the highest law of the land, specifies the right to equality and freedom and security of persons. And it is quite strong on the protection of women's rights and has, under chapter two, the Bill of Rights, established an entity that is dedicated to the protection and advancement of women's rights, the Commission for Gender Equality. This constitution further reaffirms the international commitments and obligations of the state of South Africa towards ending violence against women and children, including obligations under the UN Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women and the Rights of the Child. This year, South Africa has introduced additional three powerful pieces of legislation to advance the fight against gender-based violence. And these were as a direct result of the 2018 presidential summit on GBV, which came about because of the alarming number of, uh, and, uh, increasing number of gender-based violence. It's a Domestic Violence Amendment Act, the Criminal and Related Matters Act, 
and the Sexual Offenses and Related Matters Act. And all these acts further strengthen our legal framework for addressing GBV and closes serious gaps that were experienced before. Uh, we look at, and, and these acts look at how we define domestic violence, who commits it. There's also a focus on how to deal with accused offenders, and there's this expansion of what constitutes sexual offenses and a reporting duty for those who suspect that a child is a victim of sexual violence. Secondly, our public engagement is through policy and programs. So there is recognition that while we have advanced legislation in the world, like I've outlined above, there has not been sufficient, this has not been sufficient to prevent GBV. So you really need strong policy and programs. So we've therefore developed an aggressive national strategic plan on gender-based violence and femicide, which we are currently implementing. And what is so special about this strategy is that it was developed on a multi-sectoral collaborative platform, and it is quite comprehensive. And in August of this year, we had the first review on the implementation of this plan. Madam Moderator, there's also a strong focus on communities because GBVs happens in our communities, in our families, and we need the communities to put an end to it. So a good example of engaging communities is an initiative called Under the Tree Dialogues. It engages all members of communities across all ages to talk about GBV, what causes it, how to prevent it, and what it is. In terms of programs, we continue to expand the Tituzela care centers, which are really on the response side, providing care, psychosocial support and shelter, but also contributing to prevention. Thirdly, uh, my third point and last one really is around partnerships. The South African government recognizes that it cannot defeat the pandemic of GBV alone. So strong partnerships have been established with all sectors of our society. And the private sector has, been brought, has brought resources to the table. Civil society has really been an incredible partner in its response and drive to tackle GBV. Now we are looking forward to how the private sector in particular can partner further with government and other sectors to address technology facilitated GBV. And in fact, this is already happening whether it's with Uber or with um, our tech-based companies in South Africa. To conclude, um, Excellencies, Madam Chair, the South African government will continue fighting GBV at home and advancing policies and programs at home and internationally that are geared towards ending all kinds of gender-based violence against women and girls. And I want to say that we do appreciate the programs delivered by the UNFPA. They do reach South Africa. They do make an impact in South Africa. And the UNFPA can be assured of our continued support. I thank you. I thank you so much, Ambassador Joyeni. And I wanna point out three points that you made um, in your remarks that really stuck out to me. Policy, programs, and partnership. Policy being those three pieces of legislation that you mentioned were recently passed to combat gender-based violence in South Africa. Programs, you mentioning the under the tree dialogues that really get to the heart of the community, those conversations with people of all ages to even be able to identify what is gender-based violence, how does it, how does it affect uh, women and, and girls and how to combat it. I think that's something really important. And then those partnerships, as you mentioned, in order to uh, keep this at the forefront, um, policy being a huge part of that, but also ensuring that we're having the conversations in the community and then across communities here, our global community, so that we know what's happening in South Africa and we know what's happening um, and what we're doing as different um, people across the globe to combat this. So I want to thank you so much for your remarks. And now I'd like to introduce 
the Australia Deputy Representative Ambassador, Dr. Fiona Webster, to deliver remarks to us. And I want to thank you for joining us. Good day um, uh, to you to deliver our next set of remarks. Thank you so much, Melissa. Um, and thank you, too, to my distinguished colleague from the Mission of South Africa, Ambassador Matthew. Um, and also, of course, to our dear UNFPA colleagues uh, for convening this really important meeting today to mark the beginning of these 16 days of activism. And can I compliment Nafatisu on her Zoom background in particular? I really um, particularly like the placard which read that if you're not livid, you're not listening. Um, so hopefully everybody that is attending this meeting today is feeling livid as they ought to be given the statistics that we're hearing. Look, Australia greatly values UNFPA's work, um, this continued work on shining a light on gender-based violence, and in particular, the escalating trend of online violence. We particularly welcome the opportunity to speak about these issues, as I said, on this day to commemorate the beginning of 16 days of activism from tomorrow, the 25th. Australia is deeply concerned about the trend of online violence and its impact on women and girls. One thing is clear, the overrepresentation of online abuse towards women reflects broader gender inequalities in society. Women and girls can experience online abuse that is personal, it's sexualized, it's often violent and threatening, and it can cause real and enduring harm. And sadly, online gendered abuse starts young. In Australia, Plan International Research found that 65% of girls and young women have experienced a range of online harms on social media. That is an alarming figure. And while information technology has enabled many women and girls to remain connected and to continue work and learn online during COVID-19, our reliance on information technology has facilitated increased rates of online harassment and abuse and also enabled its perpetrators. In Australia, women with diverse sexualities or fluid genders, Indigenous women, women with a disability and women from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds are more likely to receive targeted online abuse than the public. The nature of online gender-based violence can vary and it takes many forms. It can also be insidious and hard to detect. Unfortunately, harassment and abuse on the internet can also lead women to withdraw from online discussions and self-censor to feel safe. But there are practical actions we can take to reduce the risks of online violence and to promote safety for women and girls. So today I'd like to outline some of the efforts that the Australian government has taken to address gender-based violence, both online and offline. Firstly, the eSafety Commissioner. That is Australia's national online safety regulator and educator. It was created in 2015, and it's the world's first independent statutory authority whose sole purpose is the protection of its citizens online. E-safety has a broad remit that operates under three distinct pillars. Protection, using civil powers to compel the takedown of harmful content and the reporting and investigation of cases. Prevention, through research, education and training programs, including tailored training for women and family violence frontline workers. And proactive and systematic change by encouraging the tech industry to take more responsibility and to build safety into their design and their products from the ground up. Second, the Australian government held a national summit on women's safety in September this year. The summit brought together people with lived experience of violence, service providers, academics and advocates. Importantly, the summit, along with other consultations, will inform the next national plan to end violence against women and children, which will come into effect in mid-2022. 
And third, Australia has responded to the urgent need to address violence against women and girls in the Indo-Pacific region through a range of measures that are supported by our development program. In particular, we've, we're pleased to support UNFPA's initiative, No Vor da Data, which is strengthening much needed data on the prevalence of violence against women in the Asia Pacific. And let me conclude by noting that the complex nature of gender-based violence, both online and offline, requires a multifaceted approach and a response that involves public institutions, the private sector, which is the partnerships, of course, that um, Ambassador Matthew was mentioning, and also civil society, all working together. In this regard, Australia is pleased to be collaborating with critical partners, such as UNFPA, on our shared commitment to eliminating all forms of gender-based violence. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ambassador Webster. And I wanna point out just a couple of the things that um, you mentioned that also stuck out there was uh, the creation of the eSafety Commission in 2015 with the focus of online safety for all, protection, prevention, and uh, being proactive, implementing change in the tech industry and, and holding the tech industry uh, more accountable for uh, for people's safety online, the national summit that took place, and then also tackling um, issues that are affecting um, women across the spectrum, women, um, indigenous women, women um, with disabilities, women who um, may identify um, as gender fluid, and just women from all backgrounds. Um, and I also wanted to point out just overall um, from our opening remarks, some of the things that we have uh, noted in and heard repeated are one, those staggering statistics, um, 736 million women being subjected to gender-based violence in their lifetime. And, and so what I wanted to say is, you know, yes, that's a staggering number. And, um, you know, that shock should stay with you because that number means that out of, out of all of those people you're hearing about, then we heard the statistic of one in four young women. That means that that's likely someone that you know, um, you've worked with, someone that could be in your own family that has experienced gender-based violence at one time or another. And to the point of sometimes um, with this uh, technology uh, facilitated gender-based violence, people um, uh, do sometimes, it, it, it may cause someone to self-censor or withdraw when these are spaces that um, do have positivity and you do want people to engage and to seek resources and to seek support but when you feel like that place online where you a lot of us go for news entertainment what have you is also turning into a place that um, could potentially cause you harm then people are withdrawing and this is the kind of space where we say we all have a part to play so we all do have that part to play online and and making it a more inclusive space for everyone. So I want to thank um I want to thank everyone for the opening remarks that were provided this morning to get this conversation uh, started and to get us thinking really about the ways in which we can act, right? We are, we are uh, starting off the 16 days of action when it comes to uh, against gender-based violence. How can we do our part, both as individuals and um, as a collective? And so we just heard about the ways in which um, things are happening in different governments. Australia, we thank you, and, and South Africa um, as well, from the government perspective, from um, th those perspectives. And now we get to delve a little bit more into uh, dialogue about some of the things we talked about. So the eSafety Commission, for example, um, in Australia, and then also talk a little bit about what is happening in terms of moving from activism to accountability, as we heard, right? Not just talking about it, but how do we implement it? How do we work together to make these things happen and to put it end to gender-based violence? So I'm gonna move into the dialogue now. And this first dialogue is going to highlight gender-based violence prevention, because prevention is something we heard a lot about um, in these opening remarks. How do we do that? What kinds of things are we implementing? What are those responses and innovations? Where and who um, do we innovate with for change? So to open this dialogue, I would like to welcome 
uh, Ms. Andrea Wonar, UNFPA's Mozambique country representative, for whom I have two questions um, that will get this conversation started. So I'm gonna pose those questions to you and I wanna thank you for joining us today. And again, for everyone joining us, good, good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, because we know we have so many great time zones joining us uh, today. And I want to um, pose these cool questions uh, to you and then invite you to respond. So good morning. Good morning. So Mozambique faces the interlinked impact of insecurity, conflict, and natural disasters, which has been further compounded by public health risk from the COVID-19 pandemic. In this context, how is UNFPA, through its programming, managing to disrupt the cycle of violence to prevent and respond to gender-based violence. We've been talking about being disruptors um, a lot and we're hearing that across the board. And then the second question is, what are the strategies being used to innovate for change? And how has working across the nexus of both humanitarian yeah. development and peace actions enable the delivery of life-saving interventions and development while responding to these conflicts. So that first question again is, how is UNFPA through its work programming managing to disrupt the cycle of violence to prevent and respond to gender-based violence? Okay, thank you so much. And uh, thank you for inviting me to be on this uh, very esteemed panel of, of guests today. Um, let me just start by saying the context here in Mozambique is, is maybe the complete 180 from what we've just been talking about. Uh, we're talking about a context where 62% of women are literate, 45% of school age girls have never attended school, uh, one in four women have experienced physical or sexual violence, and almost half suffer in violence, never even suffer in silence, never even seek help. One in two girls marry before the age of 18, and they're five times more likely than boys to do so. So that in itself is a form of gender-based violence um, in our view. Mozambique is also incredibly challenged by multiple emergencies, which render women and girls even more vulnerable than they are in, in normal times, if you will. Mozambique is ranked the ninth most disaster prone country in the world. So you mentioned uh, COVID-19, you mentioned conflict, um, but we also have numerous climate related um, disasters and health emergencies uh, like uh, endemic malaria and, and cholera, which, which make these emergencies incredibly complex. Um, we have a, a situation of five years of insurgency in the north of the country that has led to the displacement of a third of the, the population of the province of Cabo Delgado, one third, and the devastation of most of the resources for gender-based violence uh, support, for education, and, and for health. As, as you know, COVID-19 completely activates existing vulnerabilities as well. Uh, we had huge cyclones in 2019 that we are still responding to because people have, are still displaced and people are still trying to recover their lives in the central part and the northern part of the country. So what are we doing? Really, for us, it's all about how do we build resilience? How do we um, empower women and girls to prevent and respond to gender-based violence? So one of the very first things we do and have done, particularly under COVID, is ensure the continuity of services. And we do that by making sure that frontline health workers and social, um, social protection workers are able to get out there with protective equipment. They're able to deliver life-saving essential medicines and equipment. Uh, we have procured ambulance boats to be able to um, remove people from their situations and get them to safety and to help. And we have trained service providers who normally wouldn't have this kind of information on how to provide psychosocial support um, or alternative sexual and reproductive health care. We have trained them to be able to go out to the communities. 
We have helped uh, the government create mobile health teams because in these incredible uh, situations of insecurity, be, be it that people are displaced by conflict, be it that they're displaced by a natural disaster, or be it that they're stuck in their homes and their huts because of COVID, um, we are equipping mobile health teams to go out to, to respond to those needs. And one of the things we have done is really take advantage of existing health knowledge, information, services, and care, and integrate the gender-based violence response um, services to those, those pre-existing services. So integrated support and taking it out to the communities because women and girls, uh, particularly under COVID and in displaced situations, they just can't get to the, to the resources they need. Um, one of the other um, interventions we use is all about creating um, space. And, and the theme of this is about creating space for women to exist safely. But here, it's, it's really about just creating spaces for women to exist in inside, not even in public. So we have uh, safe spaces for displaced girls where they, um, we identify safe spaces within the, the districts to try to create a new normal for those girls, to try to create a place where they can go and find peer support, uh, be mentored, be educated, and know where they can get support and services and to build their own esteem and their own leadership abilities to be able to respond to um, abuse and uh, child, child marriage and any other form of sexual violence. We also work extremely hard to be inclusive. We know that persons with disabilities are six times more likely to experience gender-based violence. So it's extremely important that we adapt our programs um, and that means training healthcare providers, training psychosocial health providers to be able to adapt their, their expertise to persons with disabilities, be they physically disabled, be they mentally disabled, be they hearing impaired, um, whatnot. But it also means integrating those girls into our, into our, men, into our mentorship programs and, and making them part of the new normal, making them part of the larger community and really being inclusive and leaving no one behind. We have also worked very hard to expand existing help hotlines. So under the 2019 cyclones, which uh, devastated the country, Cyclone Zidai and Kenneth, the United Nations set up something called the Lina Verde, which is a free help hotline. And it was originally designed to report abuse of food distributions and, and people not, they could uh, report fraud in the, in the delivery of humanitarian aid. Um, well, we have now expanded this to include information and services for the response to gender-based violence. So we have trained operators on the Lina Verde to be able to respond in several different languages to anybody who calls who needs support, psychosocial support, medical support, um, legal support, or support to contact the police about gender-based violence. Um, and this has been incredibly successful. Um, we, have ex we are experimenting with something called e-vouchers to empower women and girls to meet their menstrual hygiene needs and their basic hygiene needs, as well as their own safety. So in those kits um, or in those vouchers, we give them um, the opportunity to buy a whistle so they, when they go out at night to use the latrine, they can blow that, that horn and raise that, that whistle for help. We make sure they have light and lanterns to be able to go out. And we make sure that they have what they need to preserve their basic dignity while they're menstruating, because otherwise they're stuck in their tents, they're stuck in their, in their huts, and there's no way for them to go out and get the gender-based violence support or the sexual and reproductive health uh, services that they need. So that's another way we're empowering uh, women and girls. Another, um, another approach that we're using, and this is the transformative one, it's really about changing the hearts and minds of not only girls, 
but boys. So we have introduced male mentorship programs and we are working very closely with community leaders to really talk to them about what does human dignity mean? And what, what is the impact of gender-based violence on their communities? And how does it continue the cycle of poverty and, and weakness and fragility? So we are working to empower girls and women and we're working to change the hearts and minds of men and women and girls. Um, what I wanted to say also is you mentioned um, partnership in the first presentation. And I think the other thing we're working very hard to do is to help the government with what it calls the multi-sectoral mechanism for integrated assistance to women victims of violence. We have helped them create an application called Info Violencia. And Info Violencia basically is creating a gender-based violence data system, a digital tool for case management. So when a woman is violated, she doesn't have to repeat that experience over and over and over again. When she goes for medical, she goes for psychosocial, she goes to the police or she goes to the courts. Her record is there in one ficha unica, we call it, in one place. And it's confidential, but more importantly, it's an important step in the country's ability to really better analyze and manage the resources to respond to gender-based violence. We are piloting it in 18 different places in the country. So this kind of mechanism is extremely important to empower national uh, governments, as well as provincial and district level, for them to understand the magnitude of the problem. It's also a way to educate and sensitize uh, potential um, uh, perpetrators. It's a means of amplifying what's happening, and it's a, a way to help stop those perpetrators by leading to effective arrest. And finally, to inspire confidence in survivors that they themselves will be able to get help and justice so that they can live dignified lives and they can continue um, to be resilient and productive members of society. So I don't know if I've reached my 10 minutes, but for us, it's all about giving women and girls the power they need to overcome and changing the hearts and minds, not only of girls and women to, to help empower them, but also of the men and the leaders in the communities so that they see the value in preventing and responding to gender-based violence. Thank and you. Thank you so much, Ms. Andrea Wonar for um, just giving us some insight into what's happening there um, on the ground in Mozambique and also the ways in which you are, um, as you mentioned, meeting the community um, and communities where they are, empowering women, um, ensuring a continuity of services uh, available, and then training people in the community to be able to deliver that care and those resources. And I think um, one of the things you said uh, that we, I think we're just kind of going to see as a theme today is to um, ensure that integrated support and ensure that both men and women are um, involved in ending gender-based violence and providing those resources where people are to identify, provide that peer support and to um, have an inclusive approach. So we thank you uh, so much for providing us with this update and this, this really um, key information on what is actually happening and being done, actively being done um, to, uh, to combat gender-based violence. So we want to thank you. Thank you so much for allowing me to share. And so we, we moved from, from that, which is kind of talking about the ways in which, you know, we, we're saying, how can we be gender-based violence disruptors? The ways in which we can uh, facilitate integrated support as was just outlined to us. And now we wanna look at ways we can effectively, um, more ways we can effectively respond to technology facilitated gender-based violence. And so this dialogue will be on understanding the nature and impact of that technology 
based technology facilitated violence, which we heard a little bit about in our opening remarks, but now we're going to hear a little bit more about it and how to respond to that, as well as what you can do, um, how you can play your part to help prevent that, what we're seeing happening online more and more as, as you know, we're kind of uh, utilizing the online space for so many things. So how can we play our part in that? Um, so for that, I, I wanna introduce An Anita La Avant and Leonia Burnham from the Australia E-Safety Commission, which we heard about earlier. I wanna acknowledge that you know, due to the time difference, we have invited these representatives to respond to our questions via video. So I'd first like to um, share those questions with you, our audience, and then invite our team to play. And so we had two really specific questions for the eSafety Commission. As you heard, it was a commission that was started in 2015 with the focus of ensuring people's safety while they are online. Um, in our, and this is uh, the eSafety Commission of Australia. So the first question is that uh, is has to do with the eSafety Commission releasing a list of recommendations on technology facilitated gender based violence. And one of those recommendations mentioned how um, an integrated approach, something we just heard about, between the domestic and family violence sector, the disability sector and the justice systems um, is imperative to combating this technology facilitated GBV. And so we want to ask the um, Australia E-Safety Commission to elaborate on that important integration, because as we're hearing, integrated support systems and services is something that's really important um, to approach um, you know, combating gender-based violence and having an approach where people across the board are involved, right? That community involvement that we talked about and that government involvement across the board. And then our second question um, has to do with that there was the creation of new technology. The creation of new technologies can be beneficial for our society, but we also have seen how technology is also can also be damaging to marginalized groups. There are a number of technology facilitated gender by gender based abuses and that list of abuses is growing it's one that um, is just too long. How can we hold big tech to a higher standard for protecting their audiences as they develop new technologies and how can we in, how can we mitigate the impact technology is causing on our women and girls and I want to point out that um, Ambassador Webster already alluded to the fact that one of the key um, components that you know Australia is focusing on is holding big tech um, accountable for people's safety online, especially women and girls. So I invite our team now to play this video um, that will give us a little bit more insight onto some of the things that the eSafety Commission in Australia um, has done and is working on where this is concerned with a specific focus on technology facilitated gender-based violence. Thanks for this opportunity to spend some time with you and talk a little bit about the program and the work that we're doing at the eSafety Women. My name is Leonie and I am the program manager of capacity building for frontline workers who are dealing with the challenges of technology facilitated abuse. And I'm Anita. I head up the Women in the Spotlight program in eSafety Women. Um, it might be a good place to start to tell you a little bit about the work of the eSafety Commissioner um, and the way that we, uh, we operate. Australia's eSafety Commissioner, uh, we often are just known as eSafety, was created in 2015 as the world's first dedicated online safety regulator, whose sole purpose is the protection of our citizens online. We have a range of civil powers to compel takedown of illegal or harmful content, whether it's child sexual abuse material, uh, pro-terrorist con content, or the non-consensual sharing of intimate images. Our model is built on three pillars, and you'll hear us talk about this as the three Ps. Uh, the first P is protection through our reporting and investigative schemes. The second is prevention through research and evidence-based education and training programs like the ones that Leone runs. And the third P is proactive and systemic change, where we encourage the tech industry to take more responsibility and build safety into the designs and development 
of, the products from the, of their products from the ground up. We apply this model to every aspect of our work, especially the protection of women. So Leonie, what is technology facilitated abuse? To put it in context, it's an extension of unhealthy relationships. It's to do with power and control, and technology is just the platform that perpetrators use to be able to get the woman or the children, girls involved, to do what they want them to do. So that's what technology facilitated abuse is. Yeah, and you talk to me about this all the time, particularly in the uh, in in the types of technology that is used. You talk to me a lot about that it's low tech. Um, what do you mean by low tech? Yeah, great question, Anita. We, we do find that um, people will often think the technology is quite complicated, that it's to do with drones flying overhead or it's some sort of new whiz-bang technology, but it's actually your everyday technology that we're using every single day. It's the mobile phones, it's the um, bombardment of text messages that relentlessly, they might be not just five or ten, we're talking about hundreds and hundreds of text messages a day. We're talking about emails that fill up all the email accounts. We're talking about hacking into social media accounts or community communication platforms. So any opportunity that a perpetrator has to be able to harass or torment or monitor or stalk uh, their victims, that's what they will do through their technology. So that's very low tech, low common technology that they're using, um, but it's to do with the frequency and the matter that it goes on and on, often for years in fact. Yeah, now, we don't work directly with women experiencing technology facilitated abuse. We work with the frontline workers who they go to for support. Why do we do that in, how, how did that program develop um, so that it was that you focused on the frontline workers? Well, referring back to our three pillars, the work that, that I'm doing or leading in the program at eSafety Women is very much around the prevention space. And the idea is if we can provide workers who are out there working with women directly, we are they are more likely to have an impact to be able to identify and support those that are impacting by it. Looking at all the kinds of workers that women or children are likely to have a touch point with uh, during their journey of their abuse or their advice uh, and the places that they might make disclosures. So some one things we've learned, and we know this from our research as well as from the practice experience with those we talk to, is that a woman may make a disclosure at somewhere where you don't expect it to be. It might be a doctor's surgery. It might be when they're at the emergency department. It could be when they're talking to their lawyer about making a will. It could be to a government employee in some other unrelated way. So for that reason, we have a very integrated approach in what we do. We're very much about giving some skills and some knowledge to all workers that are likely to be a touch point for a, where a woman or a child might make a disclosure of their abusive relationship. One of the things we work on in the training sessions with frontline workers is to talk to them about looking out for red flags. Sometimes it'd be quite difficult to identify them. So to give you a practical idea of that sort of thing would be, we say, if the device it seems to, the battery seems to be draining more than it should, or there's a spike in the data use that's inexplicable, that could be an indication that there's in fact spyware that's on that device, which would indicate that the information is actually being sent to a perpetrator's device. So that in the WITS program, um, the aim of the program is to empower women to feel in charge of their um, online presence and be able to really uh, take control of uh, the conversations that are happening online um, and protect themselves as much as possible. We really focus on that empower empowerment approach um, by looking at uh, what can we do um, at, to raise the awareness of online abuse and really recognise it throughout the community as something that is, is that is um, experienced differently by women. You know, at eSafety, um, over two thirds of our reports to our investigation branch mm. are from women and girls. Um, and we find again through the research that women experience uh, online abuse in the workplace differently from, from men. And we just want to um, just take a moment there. I want to just make sure if whether or not there was any other information that uh, they were going to share there with us. But I want to point out some of the important information that we just heard um, in that video from the Australia's eSafety Commission. And one of those major things is making women feel comfortable 
um, to be able to feel like they can go and talk about this to someone. So that integrated approach comes back up um, again, because when you have the opportunity to train frontline workers, train a support staff or uh, train folks that they may come into contact with in, in different spaces, right? You may not be able to determine, you know, uh, when someone may feel comfortable to share their experience or, or that experience or experiences of gender-based violence. But what you want to do is create that um, sense of community and that training so that one, it can be recognized and two, that they can get the support that um, they feel they need. So some of the things that were mentioned was training of frontline workers, uh, specialists and support staff so that there is that integrated approach, being able to look and recognize some of those red flags that may come about. Um, and also uh, just to reiterate those three Ps, uh, protection, prevention, and being proactive um, when it comes to um, the online space and holding tech companies uh, accountable for creating um, more safe spaces online. So we wanna thank the Australia eSafety Commission for just delving a little bit more into uh, what gender-based technology facilitated gender-based violence is and the ways in which they're combating it. And again, what we're seeing kind of across the board, and I think it's really important to continue to point out is how important this integrated approach has been, whether it's um, Australia, as we uh, just heard from Mozambique and that integrated approach that's taking place there, um, South Africa, or um, anywhere, um, integration is really key here. Um, so everyone knows and uh, feels uh, and understands that we all have a part to play. And whether big or small, you can help affect change. And you can be that person that makes a difference in a woman's life who may be experiencing gender-based violence and needs that support at that time. So we want to thank the Australia eSafety Commission uh, for that. And that brings us right into uh, the next part of our, of our discussion, which is um, moving us from activism uh, to accountability. We've been hearing a lot about how we hold um, big tech or how we hold governments um, or ourselves accountable. But one of the most important things we wanna do today um, is talk about how we call people into the conversation versus calling them out for what we perceive to be what they may or may not be doing to combat gender-based violence. And so for this um, part of the conversation, I'd like to introduce uh, Ms. Gladys Acosta Vargas, the chair of the Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, known as CEDAW. And Ms. Vargas, my questions for you are centered on advocacy and accountability. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I'm going to get into uh, those. Go, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, just I want to hear your questions. Yes, you, you look very uh, excited and eager to answer. So I thank you so much for joining us. Um, and I want to start off by asking you specifically, uh, we heard a little bit earlier, and now we can delve a little bit more into it, the experiences of Indigenous women and girls. Um, they're at the forefront of grassroots activism to end GBV and demand climate justice. Um, yet they experience a dis disproportionate violence in a multitude of ways. So drawing from CEDAW's 79th virtual session about intersecting forms of discrimination against and participation rights of indigenous women and girls, how do we meet indigenous women halfway via accountability mechanisms? And more importantly, how will CEDAW ensure the involvement of indigenous women and girls in these accountability mechanisms? How do we ensure their involvement um, in these mechanisms that have been worked to create that accountability? And then the second question is this year, women and girls have experienced institutional withdrawals from human rights conventions and several threats of rollbacks on women's rights. So in response to these uh, steps back that we've taken in the protection of women's, humans, women's human rights, um, women and girls have led advocacy movements and protests around the world to combat this. 
So has there been any involvement of these activists within CEDAW and or has CEDAW included some of these women as yet in some of the work that you are doing surrounding this and to and to answer to some of those rollbacks we've seen on women's rights. So I know that's a mouthful, but we'll go back to the first question is just how do we ensure that um, how does how will CEDAW ensure that involvement of indigenous women in these accountability mechanisms. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to, to thank you and FPA for this, uh, for inviting me for this important meeting. And uh, I, I'm, I was very, very interested in listening the first part of this meeting. And uh, I found very, very interesting. And uh, I, I would like to thank Ambassador Johini and Ambassador Webster for their presentation and also to the UNFPA representative in Mozambique, uh, Ms. Wagner, really very uh, important presentations and, uh, and how you are dealing with gender-based violence uh, in concrete terms. And this is what we are doing in, in, in CEDO. And specifically, you are talking about indigenous women I really would like to, to tell you that we are in a very important process right now. We are um, formulating a, a new general recommendations on the rights of indigenous women and girls. But this is a very different process because now we are, we are inviting from the very beginning all the women's, uh, indigenous women's organizations to discuss with the committee about the content of this uh, general recommendation. And uh, uh, in short terms, uh, I think that there is an interpretation of the, of the convention uh, under the eyes of indigenous women. And, uh, and we are looking at the state obligations, the commitment of the state to protect uh, women's and, and indi women, indigenous and women, women and girls, and that, that have a, an indigenous background in all the territories in the world. And this is something that uh, we, we are looking at the, of course, the UN uh, Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People as, as a basis. And of course, uh, we are listening very carefully to what the women are saying, and they are um, promoting uh, the, an interpretation of the self-determination, the right to self-determination, uh, not only in general for indigenous people, but concretely uh, what means in lives of women and girls. And uh, of course, they, they are also saying that their lives were disrupted by COVID-19, but uh, we need to go beyond that. And uh, they, they were very clear that they don't want to be treated as victims. They want to be treated as act actors, political actors. And I think that uh, uh, I would like to, to say that the main point here is to how we, the world, and of course the CEDO committee as an international a treaty body are listening to their voices. And then uh, I would like to say that it's not new for us. We are including the rights of indigenous women in the list of issues when we discuss about with governments about the compliance of the of the CEDAW convention. We are including the, the rights on the concluding observations for each country. Now the process on the general recommendation, we are also taking, taking account of the rights in the individual complaints under the optional protocol. And then we are very careful now about reprisals because of course, um, many indigenous women leaders are uh, facing threats, intimidations, harassment, stigmatization and all kinds of violence. But this is something that it's under the responsibility of the state parties. 
in CEDAW. We have 189 state parties and we promote the protection of, of indigenous women, not only in their territories, but where they are. If they are in transit to other countries, if they are a migrant in other countries, they need to be protected where they are. And we are far of this idea of that, that women, indigenous women are only in rural areas. Women, indigenous women are everywhere, are in urban areas. They are working in different fields, but maybe what we need to understand is that the, which is the main difference for their rights. It's not only, they need not only constitutional protection, equality, non-discrimination, of course, institutional mechanism, justice, uh, uh, concrete ways of fighting violence, as we were saying, but they, we, they need also a clear protection of their culture, a clear protection of their ancestral territories, land, and very important, their spirituality. There are a lot of threats to spirituality uh, and that women were very, very focused on the protection of their own spirituality. And, and of course, they, they need a very specific social protection. And, uh, and of course, issues like food, like access to water, access to seeds, access to environmental rights are very important for, for indigenous women. But as I said, it's not us that we are going to give the right this. We are going to listen to their voices, but because the rights are in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. We are going to put them in a more explicit way, the rights, but it's not back because the rights were not there. The rights were there, but now we are going to expand the, the social awareness on their rights. This is for the question on how to go from, from uh, advocacy to, to, to accountability, because yeah. of course we are in a realm of accountability for state parties. But also I, I think I, I would like to say that uh, particularly uh, regarding violence against women. And we have a very important tool, which is the GR, the general recommendation number 35 that we developed in 2017. But the main issue here is that we need to address all the, all the steps of what we call the due diligence. We need to work on prevention. We need to work on the investigation of crimes. We need to sanction these crimes. And they're very important. We need to reparate. The reparation is very important for women. Then this framework of the due diligence is really part of the state obligations in order to address gender-based violence. Of course, this was a discussion long, long, long time ago in before 93. It was difficult to argue that violence against women was a part of, of human rights. But after 23, after 93, in the, in the Vienna, uh, in Vienna um, Conference on Human Rights, it is clear that not only violence is a violation of human rights, but you know, for us in CEDO, is the grave, the most probably perversive way of discriminate women, then we need to look at violence as a, a key point to, to address discrimination against women. And it's not only, of course, all the things that state need to do in order to, to protect women from violence, but the connection between violence and all other forms of discrimination is very important. That's why indigenous women you know, are, are asking us not only to address violence against women, but to address the whole, the whole concept of discrimination against them. And, and I think that this is not only clear for, in this case, for indigenous women, 
but it's also clear for all women. Then uh, I think that we are talking now about state, the commitment of state parties. And we have here, here, here from, from Australia and from, from South Africa, examples of how to commit and of course, the work of UNFPA is doing in Mozambique also is a very good example on how to do the right things at the right moment. And, uh, and, and I think that we, now we are in a very difficult moment because we are addressing consequences of the COVID-19, which are very, very pervasive for women and girls, but also to see the future with different eyes. And for that, I think that the political participation of women, not only in public space, but in political spaces are very important because otherwise we are going to continue to be in the circle of fighting violence against women. We need to break this, this circle to, to open that circle and, and give more power to women in political uh, realm, in political uh, spaces, and, uh, and, uh, and also in all public spaces. And uh, with that, I, I would like to also stress that partnerships, as, as was said, are, are very important. We are beginning to a very interesting dialogue with private sector, I think, because of course we, we, we talk directly to the state parties, but we know that uh, the, the participation and the involvement of private sector, it's a key partnership now. And that's why uh, we need to involve them. And, uh, and I, I was really uh, very, very happy to hear all the advancement on violence, online violence, because this is really something that is, is, will going, is going to be part of our future. Because we have to deal with the dangers, but more and more, we need to accept that this is a very important way of empowering for women. There is no possibilities for education, for, for the, the involvement in, in the working um, world for women if they don't deal with technology. Then technology cannot be a, a, a space for fear. Technology needs to be a space for development, for empowerment. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much to Gladys Acosta Vargas, the chair of the CDAW committee. And um, as you just mentioned, technology has to should be a space of empowerment, a space of connection, and a space of support. And, and we have a lot of work to do to ensure that we create those spaces that we want to see online. I just want to point out um, one of the things you mentioned in responding to the questions about um, indigenous women being at the forefront of grassroots activism to end gender-based violence and the importance of cultural competency when it comes to respecting cultural practices, respecting local norms, and also um, ensuring that uh, people feel uh, safe when responding um, or when sharing with you or someone else uh, experiences of gender-based violence. So that cultural competency uh, point is really important. And then you said, how do we, and we meaning us as a global uh, community, um, how do we uh, come together and commit to doing um, our part to create the change that not only that we want to see, but that we need to see because this has an impact across the board. And then again, how do we protect, um, prevent and be proactive in ensuring that we see um, improvements continue? So um, I wanna thank you um, uh, for your uh, remarks there about what is what you know? What is being done and uh, CDOS commitment and responses um, to gender-based violence in combating that? And I want to thank all of our speakers. This this conversation I feel has been really dynamic in the fact that we are not only talk you know having the conversation about what we will do, what we hope to do. It's what's happening now, um, what are we doing, what has been put into action, and how do we now take it a, a step forward? 
and also involve, um, you know, not just people at, at maybe at a government level, but communities, because it definitely does start um, in the communities and everyone has to feel as though they have um, a, a buy-in. So again, how are we calling people in versus calling people out um, to feel, um, you know, and to take up action against gender based violence. So I'd like to thank all of our speakers for their responses. And now I believe uh, we do have uh, a question from the um, audience, but I also want to uh, re, I think this is a reaffirmation of, of what we know is happening um, on the ground and, and also um, the action that's being taken to answer the instances of gender-based violence that we're seeing happening in real time, um, as well as the fact that uh, with technology, uh, we're facing an expansion of it in ways that um, can be harder to get a handle on, but through things like the e-safety commission or meeting people where they are um, and you know, uh, working uh, to meet people in their spaces that is, has been and is making a difference and will continue to do so. So now I wanna go to, um, I wanna open up um, the conversation now uh, for some q and I I wanna know if we have um, any questions or um, comments in the room uh, for our speakers. Um, I believe we do have one question to start us off and we wanna invite others to ask their questions as well. So I wanna, um, I believe we have a question from Ms. Uh, Violetta um, Canavez to uh, Andrea Wonar. And if you are here in the room, I believe you're in the room right now, I'll invite you to unmute yourself so you can ask the question directly. Thank you, Melissa. You're welcome. <laughs> sure. Uh, my question is actually for Ms. Gladys Acosta Vargas. And um, Ms. Gladys Acosta, on, on Human Rights Day, December 10, UNFPA is hosting an event on human rights defenders of sexual and reproductive health and rights. So, and you have already addressed some of, uh, of this uh, question uh, specifically about indigenous women, but from, from your position at the CEDAW committee, have you seen human rights defenders advocating against gender-based violence facing particular risks and challenges and what do you think we can do from the UN to support their work? Thank you. Yes, uh, I, I, have, I have seen very, very uh, clear examples of uh, women's human rights defenders, for example, in their territories uh, against uh, enterprises that are taking, uh, that are in, in the extractivist, uh, uh, initiatives uh, or, you know, uh, when they are taking territories for big projects, development projects, and, uh, you know, without any consultation, uh, without respecting the, the rules of, of asking uh, indigenous communities about uh, what to do in these cases. And I think that uh, all these cases are, are taken in the, in, the, in, the, in the committee and we discuss with the governments about that because even if it's the private sector, the government is responsible for that. Then what we are, we are promoting is a real consultation with indigenous people and including indigenous women. Because of course, we can understand that some, for example, in countries where the, the, the industry of mines is very important. We can understand that, but this cannot be uh, uh, advanced uh, against the life uh, and the, 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 the territories of indigenous women, of indigenous peoples. That's why I think uh, we need to, to, to open a, a more constructive dialogue with the state parties on this, on how to protect uh, these territories and, and the people who live there and women and, and girls who live there. 
And also I think that we need to open ways to discuss with the, with the investors. Many, many times uh, companies that are investing in, 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 in developing countries uh, on, on issues related to mines. Then uh, I think uh, there are solutions, but at this moment there is a big confrontation and in, in women's human rights defenders are having the worst part. They are incarcerated, they are tortured many, in many cases, they don't have legal aid. And you know, it's really something that is the environmental fights are really something that is needed right now. And the, and the, the issue that they are in, on the front line without support, that's why we are saying to governments, you need to protect these women because it's your, your duty. You have to, to open ways and to, to have the legislation and to have policies that protect women who are defending their people, defending their territories and defending the, the world because of course the planet they are one of the most important things, the environmental rights for them. That's why I think that uh, it's so important for the committee to continue to support women's human rights defenders and especially indigenous women. Thank you both so much for that. And I believe we also have a question um, that just came up in the chat. And that question is, what interventions, um, what interventions response to violence of women and girls with disabilities? So we heard about that a little bit earlier. So what kind of re uh, responses um, are, what interventions are taking place to respond to violence against women and girls with disabilities? And um, I will invite um, anyone to answer, Ms. Vargas, if you'd like to take that, but I'd also invite any of our speakers to answer to that question because I know we had um, some statements on uh, violence against women and violence against women and girls with disabilities a bit earlier. Andrea, I, I, I will. Yes, go go ahead. Go ahead. Hi. Okay, sure. I'd love to take that question. Um, we are working um, in a number of different ways. One is sensitizing um, the girls in particular to their rights and to the services available to them, first of all. Second is raising awareness of communities of their responsibility to protect um, persons with disabilities and the very, very high levels of violence, six times the levels of violence against uh, those members of the community. Um, inclusion, as I mentioned in our uh, girls mentorship programs and boys mentorship programs. I visited a boys mentorship program two weeks ago and there were several uh, boys with disabilities in the group. And it was extremely encouraging to see because it normalizes, it normalizes them in the community. It normalizes that they're also sexual beings and it normalizes that they are persons with the same uh, psychological strengths and weaknesses often that we have. Um, including, uh, I didn't mention, but we include persons with albinism who are extremely vulnerable and are actually targets uh, for gender-based violence um, and, and even, even worse, even uh, murder here um, and, and mutilation here in this region for all kinds of traditional cultural reasons. So it's about normalizing them as members of society. And, and as they say, we are normal. We are just like you. So it's, it's again about changing those attitudes, transforming the attitudes. Um, it's also about uh, making the information available. We make uh, the, our information available in sign language. And we find other ways of providing recordings for visually disabled people, trying to make sure that they have access to the same information and services uh, that everybody else does. And including uh, training of health workers to be able to respond to those uh, particular needs of persons with disabilities. Thank you. Thank you so much. I would like to add something. Uh, about uh, uh, women with disabilities. 
is that there are in many countries, there are uh, places, institutional uh, frame, frameworks for, for indigenous, for women with disabilities. And in many cases, there are a lot of violence inside. And uh, this is something that we are asking governments to eliminate this kind, this kind of institutions. Because you know, women with disabilities, they need to be with other people. They don't need to be in closed spaces where there are many injustices and they, they don't have the, their voice. And, and also we are discussing with, with uh, state parties about the legal framework, the, the legal framework for, the, for, for uh, women with disabilities, because they, men, in many cases, they don't have the right to decide they, they have someone who is deciding for them. In, in many cases, they, 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 they can't decide. They, they have the right to decide and then they cannot use this right because of the legislation is impeding them to, to do it. Thank you. Thank you so much for those responses. And as, as we've been talking about that, that aspect of inclusivity is so um, critical and so important, making people feel included and, and comfortable to be able to come forward and feel like they have the support um, within their community and from, from their governments to uh, report what is taking place and to also seek support. So I have one uh, final question. This question goes for, uh, to uh, Ms. Andrea Wonar. Um, I'd, I'd like to ask you if you can speak to non-traditional types of engagement to disrupt violence, uh, specifically in your experience in Mozambique, how have non-traditional innovations helped in curating a gender-based violence response? Okay, thank you so much. Um, I mentioned a few of them, but perhaps I didn't really go into enough detail. Um, one of the non-traditional responses is actually the use of ICT. And we learned during COVID that we could use ICT, uh, even working with uh, field-based service providers. So we, we moved to E-based training and, and we didn't think we could do it, but we did. And it made a big difference. Um, we moved to an e-voucher system to provide um, and empower women and, and girls with those products that I mentioned and with the ability to protect themselves and, and protect their own dignity. So that's uh, very much an innovation that, that didn't exist before. It's helpful for the local economy and it gives the women more control over once they have that voucher um, to be able to, to control what they're getting. Um, I mentioned the InfoViolencia uh, digital tool um, for the integrated case management. This is very much a, a, an ICT-based innovation, but if I tell you, um, most of the, the people who work at the police on gender-based violence are women. They tend to be largely women, and they tend to be the least well-educated. So even... Um, when you teach them how to use this digital e-based tool, they're learning, in some cases, computer skills for the first time. They are, they are becoming empowered themselves through this very act. So um, for us, this is uh, very much an innovation. And I would say the integration of the, the boys' uh, positive masculinity work um, is really turning things on their heads. And I, I, I will just say I was out two weeks ago with uh, four ambassadors who support our programs and we met the, the first group of boy mentors and I, I provoked and I asked them, so why do you wanna give up your power in society? Why, why would you give that up? I don't understand, I wouldn't if I were you. Um, and and they, the answer was really very, very encouraging. The answer was no. We have so much to gain. We have so much to gain by ending gender-based violence, by ending child marriage. We see it as a positive thing, not something that will force us to lose where, where we stand now. So it's really changing, flipping these, these mindsets on their heads and, and having the courage uh, to, to approach. Um, them as well, including, including the elder generation. We're, we're finding openness to it as well, because they see 
it's a cycle of poverty that repeats itself over and over and over again. And they don't wanna fight against that either. They can't even provide for their households, but they see when girls are educated, when girls are not married early, when, when girls are not abused, that they become very powerful breadwinners in the family. So for us, those are all big innovations compared to our traditional programming. Thank you so much for uh, sharing those innovative ways that you've been working to combat GBV. Um, I wanna acknowledge that Ambassador Joini had um, her hand raised and I believe you'd like to respond to um, the questions about um, interventions when it comes to combating violence against women and girls um, with disabilities. And I'd also like to invite Ambassador Webster uh, to, to respond to that as well and provide us with any closing remarks uh, that each of you may have. And thank you all so much. Thank you, Melissa. Yes, what I wanted to um, point out um, is that in fact, because of recognition of um, the special um, position of women with disabilities and, 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 and children with disabilities, in fact, the South African uh, government has decided to put one ministry that takes care of women and people with disability. That therefore allows for easier programming, for easier policy making to address the specific needs of women with disabilities as far as um, the, the issues that we are talking about, whether it's gender equality, uh, gender based violence, they're all addressed within one ministry. One minister and deputy minister are responsible for people with disability, women with disabilities, and so forth. And it, it really um, puts them in a better position in terms of government interventions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador. And I'd like to um, also invite Ambassador Webster to respond or to provide us with any closing remarks that you'd like to share. Thank you so much, Melissa. That's It's just been such an excellent um, discussion. I've really, really enjoyed it. And um, particularly um, some of those on the ground insights that um, we've, we've heard about the Mozambique experience. Um, the numbers there are obviously extraordinary. Um, but that said, of course, um, in Australia, we, we also have uh, enormous challenges around combating um, violence against women um, and girls, and also, um, of course, in the Pacific region. Um, in terms of our commitment to um, addressing that violence in the context of women and girls with disability in particular, that is, of course, something that Australia is extremely focused on. Um, you're probably aware that we have a very strong in, uh, international reputation for addressing disability inclusion as part of our development program. And that is um, a, a direct uh, consequence in terms of how we approach um, issues around gender-based violence as well. But um, once again, thank you so much um, for the opportunity to be a part of this discussion. Um, the day before we begin our 16 days of activism, it's given me an awful lot of food for thought and um, thank you to all of the people that have contributed. Thanks, Melissa. I wanna thank um, all of our speakers this morning, Ambassador Joini, um, for joining us from South Africa. I also wanna thank you, Ambassador Webster, um, Ms. Gladys Acosta Vargas from CEDAW, um, as well um, as uh, uh, Madame Nasi, sorry, one moment. I also wanna thank, I had a pause there. I also wanna thank Madame Diop for um, joining us and delivering our opening remarks on behalf of UNFPA's executive director, um, Ms. Andrea Wonar um, for joining us as well. And, and for, for everyone this morning for, um, this really critical and important discussion as we kick off these 16 days um, of action against gender-based violence. I just want to reiterate a couple of things um, once more because I feel like there's a common thread that we heard um, today that's really important to think about as we embark upon these 16 days um, and uh, that's uh, prote protection, uh, prevention, and being proactive as a community. And that's both in your local community, uh, within your own families, and as a 
global community as we take action against gender-based violence, that we all have a part to play, no matter how big or how small we can enact change in our own communities. I really loved uh, hearing about the under the tree dialogues, because when you just think, of, think about that, it just makes me think I'm just having a conversation with a friend. You can be the person that enacts or affects that change with a friend, a colleague, um, or someone at a higher level just by being willing to have that conversation. And that makes me think about meeting people where they are, you know, going into those communities, understanding that people have different ways of connecting to information. And that can be, uh, but a lot of that is, is taking place online where we're seeing a rise um, in gender-based violence that is technology uh, facilitated and the ways in which we can make our online spaces safer for all women and girls um, and, and create the space, whether you're a top level official or you're that person in the community that may come into contact with a woman who has experienced gender-based violence, that you too can make them feel comfortable enough to share their experience or experiences, feel safe to report and help to make a change. So again, my name is Melissa Noel multimedia journalist. It has been my honor and pleasure to moderate this discussion today as we kick off the 16 days of action against gender-based violence. Um, this event, Women and Girls' Right to Occupy Spaces Safely. And I just wanted to reiterate that because um, our job here today is to um, show and, and make people understand that it's important that women should feel comfortable to occupy any space. Um, and so today we just think about the right that women have to occupy spaces safely, but to just occupy space, you know, just to be able to take up space, to feel comfortable as was mentioned, you know, to, to walk down the street, to get online on any social media platform, uh, to speak their minds and to feel like they have a community of support and feel safe feel uh, safe online. So I will leave you with a thought of for these 16 days, I invite you to call people into the conversation, call people in to take action instead of calling them out so that we together can uh, move forward in unity um, in terms of uh, ways to, uh, of ending gender-based violence um, instead of, um, instead of calling people out so that we feel that as a collective, we can all take action. Thank you all so much. Take care.